Amen. Amen. All right, this morning, let's take our <coughs> Bibles and turn to the hymn number, or not hymn number, page number, office, let's look at it, Hebrews 12, the book of Hebrews. We're going to talk about chastening for the present, chastening for the present. It's an important thing that we see that God is not opposed to chastening. In fact, He's opposed to those of us who do not use it properly for the Lord. Let's read verse number 1 together, Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed the Bible, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the same which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This Hebrews 12, in that first part, a greater cloud of witnesses. In chapter 11, if you all these witnesses of the Old Testament, faithful, what they've done, the things of the Lord. And, uh, they see all those witnesses, then let us, let us uh, lay aside every weight and the sin that destroys the that us. Uh, when we see those witnesses, let those of us who are genuine Christians today lay aside for aside the weights, the sins, the difficulties uh, that easily beset us, that surround us. And let us run with patience. Running with patience is two separate things. Running, but running patiently. Notice the race that is set before us. There's no person, no Christian, general Christian that has the same race. Your race is not my race. My race is not your race. God beseeches us to run the race set before us. The various verses are first on running a race in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Knowing not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is tempted in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that Beateth the air, just a shadow boxer. Philippians 2, 15, 2 16, where to hold fast and holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Many people have labored in vain and run in vain. In Psalm 139, verse 5, Thou hast beset me behind and before. The Lord is all around us, and we're set by all difficulties all around us as well. Let's read verse number two together. Looking unto Jesus, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to be looking continuously, those that are saved, present tense action, under the Lord Jesus, at the right hand of the Father. He's the author of our faith, he's the finisher of faith. Cross of Calvary, he used that Greek word, the perfect tense. The Greek word is grapho, is the perfect. It's been finished, past, present, future. Looking at Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, I don't know anyone else would have joy uh, looking forward to the cross, crucifixion, pain, and suffering at Calvary. They saw the people who were going to be saved through his death. He had joy in obedience to his Father. And he endured the cross. Not only took it, but he endured it, despising the shame. There's a lot of shame in a cross. Set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the place of honor, the right hand. The Father saw his ministry, accepted it, and sat him down in honor. Now this word, looking unto Jesus. In Psalm 34, verse 5, they looked upon him and were lightened. More light came to them when you look upon the Lord. And their faces were not ashamed. Isaiah 17, in verse 78, At the day shall a man look to his Maker, at that day. His eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. I wish they'd look at the Maker today, all people in this world. And he shall look, they shall not look to the altars. They shall not look at their altars, the work of their hands, the respect that which their fingers have made the groves of the images. Then in Isaiah 45 and verse 22, Look unto me, and be saved, 
all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there's none other. I am God. What a wonderful verse in Isaiah 45, 22. In Micah 7 and verse 7, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. And in Zechariah 12 and verse 10, I will pour out my house upon the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Even in Israel's day in Zechariah, they could talk about the cross, about the piercing of the Lord Jesus Christ. People will look to that Savior. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. They shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And he's also the author, but also the finisher of the faith. In John 17, 4, the Lord Jesus in his high priestly prayer to the Father said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And then in John 19 and verse 30, John 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. To tell us, as we said, it is finished. Past, present, and future, nobody else has to add a thing. Not the Roman Catholics with their masses and pretend sacrifices, blood offerings. Then he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Deliver his spirit. And that's the finisher, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's read verse number three together. For consider him that endures the contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your mind. Uh, so consider him, the Lord Jesus. Don't faint. Don't get weary. Weariness, for example, in Job 10 and verse 1, my soul is weary in my life. He was a very weary person. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Pain all over the place with Job. Then Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might increase the strength. Our Father, our God, is a great God, powerful. And then even the youth shall faint and be weary, young men shall utterly fall. But we know that more than, yeah, we know those. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. In His strength we can do all these things, and not faint and not be weary. In Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. Then 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Be weary in evil doing, never enter into that, but well doing, don't be weary. Then as far as fainting, in Proverbs 24.10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, trouble, thy strength is small. Then in Ephesians 3 and verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations, for ye know which is, your, which is your glory. Faint not at my tribulations. Paul had many of these tribulations. And want the believers to faint or be weary or slack in any way. Let's read verse number four together. You have you not, not yet resisted, resisted the blood, blood, blood striving against, against sin. sin. <coughs> not yet resisted <coughs> under blood. Now there was a time in the early church when that did happen. They had to resist under blood. They killed and slaughtered many thousands and thousands of Christian believers. And uh, many of these Islamic people do that today. And people who are Christian people today, many of them have to resist. Even in the blood, maybe it's their death. But if you have to make a choice whether to stand fast for the Lord Jesus Christ, if He is your Savior, we don't know if everyone here is saved, those listening by the internet, or they're all saved, but if they're genuine and true Christians, will this be what you will say? I'm going to give up my Savior when I'm threatened for death so I can be saved in my life? Or are you going to stand firm and say, I will never give up my Savior? 
He gave his life ransom for me. I will stand for him no matter what happens to me, whether death or pain or suffering. Let's read verse number five together. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. children. My son, despise not thou chastening of the Lord, nor be faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now that word despise not is a present tense, negative. It means to stop an action already in progress. They were despising the chastening of the Lord. And God, through the book of Hebrews, said stop it. Stop the despising chastening. A lot of people say, I don't like chastening. That says, don't despise God's chastening. Uh, that's important that we re repeat that and understand that. Chasing the Lord, or faint when thou art rebuked of Him. We should be rebuked when we're wrong, by the Lord. And children should be rebuked by their parents when they've done wrong. <clears throat> Many parents don't do anything about chastening. The Lord does. He's the Father of all the faithful, all the true Christians. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Now that's not always the case. You wonder why some children, boys and girls, turn out screaming babies and dis discipline necessary and needed because their moms and dads don't chase them. They don't discipline, they don't discipline, they're just wild and woolly. And then in 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. Chastening my son. We've had four sons. And every one of those sons, at times, we had to chasten him, we had to discipline. I tried to be as faithful as I could, as honest as I could, and <coughs> fair as I could, and yet chasten. And I know that uh, people don't like it, children don't like to be chastened. That's why children, you see in the places where you eat, the restaurants, yelling and screaming their heads off and undisciplined. I saw them for 19 years or so at Jones Junior High School in Philadelphia and saw those students in my classes, language, arts, and English, completely undisciplined. Horrendous time to try to, to teach those brats anything, <laughs> boys or girls, either one. But in Job 5 and verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. He's happy. We should not despise him. He'll shape us up, and every one of us needs to be shaped up. This pastor, all the people in this service, and those listening on the internet, at times, every one of us needs to change what we're thinking about, what we're doing, and the Lord is the one that can you know, correct us. And happy is the man that God correcteth. And then in Psalm 94, verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. God teaches us by his disciplines. In Proverbs 3, and verse 11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Don't despise it. You need to be weary of his protection. Uh, the Lord only chastens when we need it. And that's the way with fathers and mothers in chastening and disciplining their children, only when they need it. But always when they need it. I've always said that as I've ever talked about discipline of children only and always. If you don't put all those words together, all those turns together, you fail. Only when they need it. Don't slap them around and beat them and up and it doesn't need anything. Just talking or something. Only when they really need chastisement. And then always, and the third thing is, in the proper manner. Only always and properly chasten. And the Lord is always proper. Blessed and happy is the man whom thou chasteneth. Teaches them out of that law. Proverbs 3, verse 13, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of this correction. You say, when's the Lord, Lord going to stop chastening me? I seem to be chastened quite often. 
Don't be weary of his correction. Uh, don't, he says it sometimes more than all, always, more than you think we need it. Don't be weary of his chastening. Then Proverbs 13, verse 30, 24. This is a truth that very many people in this day and age which we live do not believe at all. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. In other words, no discipline. You hate that son. You've got to bring him off the proper nourishment, admonition of the Lord. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. You know what that word means? It means early. You don't wait till a little child is three, four, five, six, it's too late. Chasten him betimes, early. Bring up a child, and then as he or she grows, they get the point. Then Proverbs 19 and verse 18. God says, Chasten thy son while there's hope. But science seems to imply that sometimes there's no hope. It's too late, but chase while well, there is hope. And let none of thy soul spare for his crying. <clears throat> There's not a single child that I believe has deserved in our family, four sons and a daughter, that I have sought to chasten. I didn't think there was hope. There's hope. Chasten us son while there's hope. And then the other thing, let not thy soul spare for his crying. That's what they do. Sometimes they, they cry more than we like to have them. Now, we don't like to see our children <clears throat> cry, but when we discipline, they cry. That's what happens. Now, let that soul, that soul spare. I remember our little son, Richard. In the little days, we called him Dickie, little Dickie boy. He was about three years old, I guess, two or three. And one day I spanked him, and he cried. <laughs> and I said, you know, Dad smacks you, Dick, because he loves you. And he turned out to be a wonderful son. And all my sons and all my daughters, uh, but one daughter, turned out. <clears throat> but not that soul spare for his crying. They do cry, there's no question about that. Many, many years ago, I brought up these children. Imagine looking back on that quite a few years, over 90 years of looking back. And then, uh, they're, they're not 90. No, no, but I'm 90 looking back. See, I'm looking back on them. I'm the 90 one looking back on the ones that used to be little ones. Not I am. Well, you're not one of my children. You're my wife. All right. Proverbs. Uh, then, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 32, that when we are judged, that is by the Lord, we are chastened of the Lord, so we should not be condemned with the world. God doesn't want us to be condemned with the world. He wants us to be upstanding and right. And so sometimes he has to judge us. And we don't like those judgments, but we don't want to be chastened and condemned with this old wicked world. And then in Revelation 3 and verse 19, that Revelation passage is a good verse as well. The Lord says, as many as I love, I rebuke. First of all, I rebuke for the Word of God and say this is not right. Rebuke and chasten. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. These people have to repent. He reminded them that he's chastening and rebuking them because he loves them. That's what I always did with my children, four sons and daughters. If I had to rebuke, it's because I love them. And that's the way the Lord is. Rebuke chasing because of his love. If he didn't love us, he just didn't care whether we're going to be tramps and <clears throat> wicked people, he wouldn't rebuke us. He wouldn't chase us. Because he loves us, so he wants to keep us straight, not crooked. He rebukes and chases. Let's read verse number six together. For whom the Lord loveth, he chases and, and scourges every, every son of whom he receives. Here again, whom the Lord loveth, he chases. It's love that causes the chastening. In Deuteronomy 8 and verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Talking about Israel there. They needed chastening. And the Lord chastens them because just like a son needs chastening. 
Then 2 Samuel 7 and verse 14. God says, I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. Chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. So God promises when we need chastening, commit iniquity and sin, he tries to get us in life. Didn't seem to work with all of Israel or all of the Gentiles or not all the Christians even today. But he, he promises in Second Samuel that's the way he handles iniquity and sin. In Psalm 6 and verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, don't rebuke me in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Uh, the Lord can be calm in his discipline, he can be disciplinary, it's not easy, but this is a psalm, David, please praise, don't chase me in thy hot displeasure. In Psalm 6 and verse 1, he repeats that in Psalm 38 and verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot <coughs> displeasure. Calm down, please, Lord, before thou dost chasten me. That's what he's saying, not the hot displeasure. Then in Proverbs 13 and verse 24, He that spareth his rod, now people don't believe in corporal punishment, if it's not with a rod, it can't be the, the, the hand and spanking. He that spareth his rod, this lets his, his son go wild and woolly, hateth his son. That's to the fathers, that's to the mothers. If you don't discipline them, you hate them. That's a strong charge against mom and dad. He that spareth his right, spareth the discipline, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him again three times early. Don't wait till the child is one and a half or two, two and a half or three, as early as possible. You don't have to be mean and ugly, you have to realize they're young, but chasten them be times, which is early in their life. You've seen some six and seven, eight year olds, it's too late. It's almost too late. When they run right back to normal, what they should be as obedient children. In Proverbs 19 and verse 18, he repeats what we read earlier. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Not spare for his crying. Let's read verse number seven together. If ye endure chastening, God is dealing with, with you as with sons. sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now this is endurance. That's a present continuous action tense in the Greek language. If he continue to endure chastening, not just once in a blue moon, not just once every while, continuously endure the chastening that you need. If you do that continuously, God dealeth with you as with son. That word dealeth is also present, continuous action. He continues to deal with you as with sons. If you continue to do the chastening, God continues to deal with you as with sons. Then for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? A father who is a good father, an obedient father to the Lord, he will chasten, he will discipline <coughs> as needed, only when needed, always when needed, in the proper manner that is needed. Only always in the manner, the proper way. And then uh, in Job 5, 17, we may have read this before, but behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. So if you're Christian, I think are happy when God corrects us, but we should be. Happy, Job said he was happy, whom God corrected. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening, the discipline, of the Almighty. Don't despise it. He doesn't do it when you don't need it. A lot of us parents do discipline when they don't need it. We're not perfect. Sometimes we make a mistake. But he or she, we thought they did something. They didn't do it. So he disciplined needlessly, frivolously, and wrongly. But God never makes a mistake. When we need it, he does it. Always, proper manner, and only. When we need it. He's a proper chaser. In Proverbs 3, verse 11, uh, we think we've covered this. Let's read it again. My son, 
despise not the chastening of the Lord, of the Lord. neither be weary in his, his, in his correction. Don't be weary. Don't get tired of it. Uh, he, he gets tired of us when we don't do what's right. He gets tired of it. Don't get tired. Don't despise it. Continue. Don't be weary in his correction. In Isaiah 26 and verse 16, Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Well, that's the only way to get people to pray to the Lord. Maybe that's what God's got to do. Chasten them. It says here, when the Lord in trouble they visited thee, and they poured out a prayer, finally in trouble, when thy chastening was upon them. Don't forget the prayer. It takes chastening to bring the prayer out of us. May it be. Let's read verse number 8 together. But if he would be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If you're without any chastisement, <coughs> genuine Christians now, uh, then you're bastards. Illegitimate children, not really saved people. A bastard is the one that's not a genuine child of husband and wife. And if for that term, we're probably not even Christians, and not sons, if you're without chastisement. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 2, we may have read this, but let's read it. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, and which have not seen, the chastisement of the Lord your God. His greatness, his mighty hand, is stretched out arm. All his mighty hands, his mighty works, all these are shown to us when he chastises us of the Lord our God. Then Job 34 and verse 31. 34, 31. Surely it is meet, it's fitting to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend anymore. When God chases us because we're doing something else to people we shouldn't be doing, Job finally gets this point, the Lord gets this point across to Job and said, uh, I have borne that just, I will not offend anyone, I'm going to stop offending people because of God's correcting me. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, speaking of our Savior, but he was, we know this, I said, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What a wonderful <coughs> picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Chastisement of our peace upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. Everyone who trusts the Lord Jesus as their Savior can be healed of their sins, forgiven of their sins, taken to heaven, because he was chastised. In order that we might have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, your genuine faith in him. It's a wonderful thing. His peace was upon him with his stripes, wounds, pains, we, genuine Christians, were healed if we trust him as our Savior. Let's read verse number 9 together. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Well, if we did okay with our fathers, our genuine human fathers of our flesh, who corrected us, who gave them reverence, we, we respected them still. And some of these young people don't respect their fathers when they discipline their mothers. It's sad. So we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. If we've been in subjection to our human fathers, so much more, a heavenly father, those who are genuine Christians, true Christians, should be in respect to our heavenly father as well. Let's read verse number 10 together. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now that's there they were a few days chasing us after our fathers. Verily they, that is the human fathers. Uh, but he for our profit. That's for the Lord, not for the pleasure and continuous pleasure that the fathers and mothers have for chasing, but the Lord for our profit, our profit. And that's very important. 
He wants us to profit by his chastening, not to simply be chastening for no reason. We might be partakers of his holiness. God wants his true children, his genuine Christians, to be holy and righteous. That's why he chastens us. That's why he t t t takes care of us in that need. As far as holiness is concerned, in Psalm 29, verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness without sin, unconfessed known sin is not holy. And worship the Lord in that holiness. In Psalm 93 and verse 5, thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. There's no sin in God's house, no sin in heaven. No sinners ever went out of that place. Their place is the lake of fire. It burns with fire and burns with hell, but not holiness in the Lord's presence. Holiness does not become thine house. And then Ephesians 4, verse 24. And that she put on the new man. That's the new nature. He's talking about true Christian, a genuine Christian. Put on the new man, the new nature. Which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Our old flesh is not righteous. The old flesh that we were born with, it's the new nature, the Holy Spirit indwelling those who are genuine Christians. That's where holiness is. That's where holiness is. The new man created in righteous and true holiness. In the new nature, the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, our new nature, there's no unholiness whatsoever. It's absolutely pure. He is pure, true holiness. Then in 1 Thessalonians 3, and verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable <coughs> in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now this is after the rapture that can occur at any time. And all the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive in January Christ will rise then. But in the clouds of eating the Lord in the air, and then seven more years, Daniel's seventieth week. The week of the tribulation, the great tribulation. And Satan will have his heyday then, that's for sure. And then after that, the battle of Armageddon, Satan and his followers will be put down. The Lord Jesus will come back, set up his running reign of Christ for 1,000 years. Satan will be bound. And we have to remember, it's talking about at his coming. Then, so coming with the saints, establish our hearts and be pure and righteous and holy, especially at his return to this earth. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He hasn't called us unto unbelievers, any believers unto uncleanness, but holiness. Holiness. Now let's read verse number 11 together. Now no chastisement for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness and the them of which exercise thereby. No chastening <coughs> seems present or joyous. Afterward, yields the fruit of righteousness only to them which are exercised thereby, who pay attention to it. That word exercise is in the perfect tense. Exercised by it in the past, when they were upset and wrong. Uh, exercised by the chastening right in the present, exercised in the future, every time that there's a problem and we're chastened, our soul's got to be exercised to change our ways, change our thinking, change whatever's wrong about us. And then, if we're really exercised thereby, if we're really insist on changing our ways of doing right, then we have the peaceful fruit of righteousness as a result. The verse for exercise, first is in Acts 24, verse 16. Herein do I exercise myself, said Paul, to have always the conscience, void of offense toward God and toward men. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, but refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now let's put some action into it, not just talk, 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 but actually exercise thyself to godliness. Hebrews 5, 14, <coughs> strong meat, Belong it to them who are full age, even those who by reason of use, that's the word of God, study and learn and read and follow. 
by reason of which have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The exercise of the senses must be there. Let's read verse number 12 together. Wherefore, lift, lift up, up the hands, hands which hang down, down and the feet of the knees. Now here's <coughs> hands that hang down are not useful for them, and feeble knees that don't do too much. In Job 4 and verse 4, strengthen the feeble knees. In Psalm 109, verse 24, my knees are weak through fasting. And Isaiah 55, 35, verse 3, strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees. Ezekiel 7, verse 17, all hands shall be feeble, all knees shall be weak as water. Ezekiel 21, verse 7, all hands shall be feeble, every spirit faint, all knees weak as water. Behold, it cometh, so he brought to pass, says the Lord. So weak knees, a lot of people are weak knees. That's interesting. That's the expression. Let's read verse number 13 together. And make straight paths for your feet, feet lest that which was lame be turned, turned out of the way. way. But let it rather be healed. So the paths of our feet should be straight, straight down the path of the Lord, straight down the path of Scripture. Lest your feet be lame and turned out of the way. When God says, this is the way, we don't turn out of that way. The right hand or to the left. And these feeble <coughs> knees and feet that are weak should be corrected and walk in the steps of the Lord himself. Let's read verse 14 together. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace, following peace. Uh, in Proverbs 16 and verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. And John 14, 27, peace I leave with thee, my peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither though it be afraid. And then uh, John 16, 33, all these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. God wants peace possessed and used. In Romans 5, 1, we know that. Let's we'll say it together. Therefore, being, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only the genuine Christians have peace with God through him, the Lord. Romans 14, 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. In Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Holiness is needed. Romans 6.19, as he have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, to iniquity, unto iniquity, now yield your members, your hands, your feet, your heart, all the members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. And then uh, in Romans 6, verse 22, be made free from sin, become servants to God, you have your fruit under holiness. Only genuine Christians can have real, genuine, godly holiness. But that's what God wants us to have in fruit. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, to the end that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God. He wants us <coughs> holy in our hearts and lives. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 7, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. In Titus 2 and verse 3, the aged women, even old women, like ladies, I don't know what the age is, but whatever you ladies think are old, likewise, if they may be in behavior, as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, I guess they'd be accusers, not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things. Then verse 15, is it 15 or 16? 15. 15. Let's read that together. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Looking diligently, continuously, present action. Uh, bitterness, for instance, in Job 10 and verse 1, my soul is weary of my life, all kinds of pain and sickness. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of of my soul. He was very, very troubled. Romans 3.14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The unsaved people, some Christians, sad to say, walking in the flesh, their mouth is full of bitterness and evil speaking as well, along with malice. And so this Hebrews 12, the first 15 verses of it, speaks very clearly to every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to us of 
not fearing chastisement or discipline, but thanking the Lord for it. And only he knows how to do it. He knows what to do about it when we need discipline and correction. We may not know what way God wants us to be corrected, but he knows. As he moves us in circumstances, whether by sickness or by circumstances, by other people, by the word of God, as we read it, whatever it means, whether they hear it in preaching somewhere, but however it comes, the Lord knows how we need correction. And he knows the means to give that correction. <clears throat> we must be listening for it and not despising it. All these verses of scripture are chastening and discipline. Useful and useful. Even though some people can't stand it. They don't want anything to do with it. They want to live their own lives. They want to walk their own walk. Talk their own talk. Act their own actions. <clears throat> and God says, no. If you want my holiness and my blessings, if you want my leadership and guidance, you follow what I say in my words and do the best you can. And if you don't do it, expect my correction. And when I give that correction to you, abide by the correction. Follow that correction and straighten yourselves up so that I may bless you again and continue to use you to my glory. Amen. That's what God is telling us. Even though we don't like to be corrected, any of us, the human beings, uh, we don't say we're perfect. We like to think there's not too much wrong with us. And why is he or she making corrections on me, saying, don't do this and don't do that. But by God's grace, we should follow him and be willing to follow him that he may use us to his glory on this earth while we still have breath in our bodies. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank and praise you for thy grace. We ask you for guidance and direction in the rest of this day. We ask for despising not of thy correction and not us want to change us for the better. Let us thank and praise Thee that Thou hast delivered those of us who are genuinely trusting our Savior, delivered us from death, delivered us from hell, and given us eternal life. Thank Thee for it. In Jesus' name for we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.